Dell cells today, um, with the possible exception of um, fog light and light speed. And so we're going to hear today to talk about um, migration between uh, Microsoft SQL Server 2000 and um, VLatest. Um, and we're going to start with a little bit of a brief walk down history lane, um, just to sort of drive home uh, how long ago 2005 actually was. Uh, we're going to talk about why now the time is to migrate and, and uh, you know, some reasons for, for doing that. Um, both technical and from a business perspective. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how Dell can help you if you decide that you want to um, come on that migration journey with us. So 2005, as I sort of said, was quite a long time ago. Uh, it was a good year. Um, it would be two years before phones that we all know today look like this. Um, the first phone that, that would look like that would be shipped in 2007 and I remember having one of those at about this time. Um, YouTube had just been launched, in fact this was a screenshot taking, taken some three months after it launched and you can see even back then uh, cat videos were in the top five of searches on YouTube, right? so we did begin as we intended to continue. Um, and uh, this was George Lucas' second go, uh, and in fact by 2005 he'd reached the end of his second string of movies uh, telling the Star Wars story, and incidentally, another 10 years down the track we're going to see the first, the first one, or the last set, which is the, the prequels. And, you know, sort of brings to mind what you were doing 10 years ago, uh, and uh, I was not doing this. Uh, so now is definitely the time to start looking at, you know, migrating to, to, to the latest version of SQL Server and there's a, good, a lot of good reasons for doing that. The number one reason is that um, support, extended support ends next year. And in fact, even, even the first line of support, um, mainline support for 2000, both 2008 releases of SQL Server has ended uh, late last year. So. Um, extended support for that will go on for a while, but what the end of extended support means is that you're not going to get any security updates, no hot fixes, um, no fixes to existing software versions, um, there'll be no documentation updates online, right, so the, 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 it's the end of the road, right. Um, high maintenance costs, so clearly uh, along with part and parcel of running SQL Server 2005, that's probably running on older hardware um, on an older operating system. Uh, and that clearly is going to increase your business risk as the warranties run out on that hardware, uh, security risks and so on and so forth on older software. And then some compliance risks. So um, it's just going to be not as secure. And the features that exist in later versions of the, the operating system and the database software do not exist in these older versions, so you're going to find it very difficult to maintain, um, you know, the, the regulatory compliance levels. As I sort of alluded to, um, you know, part and parcel of running SQL Server 2005 is probably that it's also running on Windows Server 2003, uh, which is clearly another two years older, again, than SQL Server 2005. Um, and it has the same sort of story, right? It's um, reach the end of a support life. There's no hot fixes for it. Um, it's known that it is not compliant to for certain regulatory schemes, and that you're going to have a, a problem with high cost of uh, ownership simply because uh, for two reasons. One is that that um, you know maintaining all of this old stuff um, has a cost in and of itself, and there's also an opportunity cost. Um, th there's potentially a lot of productivity and functionality up. Um, benefits you get from running later versions of software that you're not going to get if you are still running older versions. So let's talk a little bit about the gap of features that, that happen over the course of 10 years, um, which is sort of why I started with that little history lesson. So SQL Server 2005 was probably the first I don't know, in quotes, um, air quotes, modern version of SQL Server. So it's certainly the first one that, that introduced um, the modern management, the dynamic management views, which was the more modern way to get um, uh, metadata and support information outside, out of the SQL Server engine for performance purposes. Um, 
it gave us the, the, C, the common language runtime so you could put C sharp code or .NET code inside the database engine if you wanted to. Um, it added some hardware support for enterprise type features like hot add memory. Uh, ranking functions if you were doing um, business analytics or reporting type uh, workloads. And then rich, richer data types in the form of XML and XQuery, which, which at the time that this was released, XML was quite a hot topic. And then some, some high availability stuff that was a little bit better than what we had at the time, which was you know, replication and rolling it all yourself manually in the form of database mirroring. And the manageability tools were better. A couple of years later, or a few years later, um, you know, again, it was built on by Microsoft. We had um, uh, hot add CPU instead of hot add, as well as hot add memory. Um, there was some, uh, the concept of a performance governor was introduced so that you now had some control over how end users would consume the resources on the box. X events improved the manageability experience again. Um, spatial indexes were good if you were going to be doing anything to do with geo um, type workloads where you need to know where some was in the world. Um, and compression, so that was uh, quite a big savings in terms of storage and time for backing up your database. And again, on and on it goes. So 2012, we had another release. There were two releases of 2008. Um, I've sort of rolled them into one here. But 2012 added always on availability groups. So finally a grown up um, high availability solution. Column store indexes, a, a huge performance um, gain if you're doing uh, aggregate type queries. And the final slide, again, in sort of the, 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 the bridge across from 2005 to the latest release, is that, that you know, I've tried to pick out some features here where um, in the latest rev of SQL Server 2014, there's features that are not just evolutions on top of stuff that was already there, it's completely new. So a lot of these features, for example, that I've just called out here, and this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination, but a lot of those features there didn't even exist in 2005. Um, you know, in-memory type stuff, um, support for live migration on Hyper-V, um, always on availability, um, and on and on the list goes. So drilling down into some of these sort of issue, the benefits that you get, um, you know, all the way through that 10-year that period, um, culminating in SQL Server 2014, is, you know, some uh, compliance stuff, um, in particular PCI DSS3. Why this is important is that um, uh, in this world uh, where we have to sort of maintain users' privacy, the ability um, to, to have this concept called separation of duties is very important. So previously, um, this has been a theme in all databases, if you were the DBA or the person managing the database, by default it was assumed that you would have access to all the data. Um, and then also, too, if you wanted to potentially grant someone who had to do something with that data access to all the data, then sometimes they had to be granted permissions to do manageability things on the database. So that's sort of bad, right, because the DBA, what you really want is this picture here where the DBA can manage the server but not read any of the data, and the auditor or consumer of the data can look at the data but not manage the server. So. Clearly, the DBA shouldn't be able to go and look at people's credit card information, and the auditor shouldn't be able to go and create a super user on the database so he can log in later and look at anybody's credit card information. Some additional stuff that came in 2014 was some enhancements around scalability, right? So this is the normal stuff that Microsoft does in the course of updating its software. The number of physical processes that can be used on a SQL Server box went up to um, 640 and the amount of memory went to 4 terabytes. Similarly for virtual environments, the numbers increased as well. And again, we have hardware that exercises those limits. Failover clusters. So if you're still using failover clusters, and there are some scenarios in which failover clusters are a, an appropriate disaster recovery or high availability type technology, you can now have up to 64 nodes. I talked a little bit before about the concept of the resource governor. So in 2008 R2, um, we introduced a CPU governor. So that let um, 
DBAs and people managing the database to place a cap on the consumption of CPU resources. So if you had um, a server in which you wanted to make sure that, that CPU was evenly divided amongst the consumers, you could in fact enforce that now. 2014 brings the concept of uh, an I.O. governor. So you can do the same thing with IOPS. If you have only a certain number of IOPS and that you want to make sure that, that um, say, re the reporting task doesn't use all those IOPS, um, you can make sure that you put a cap on that, on that user so that they can be prevented from eating the entire system. In memory, um, there's a number of technologies to do with memory in SQL Server 2014. The first one, you may have heard the, the code name for it um, all the way through the CTP period uh, before 2014 was released, but it's Hecaton. So there are a couple of application patterns for which in memory is very, very handy. Right? So, and I've listed three, three there. So if you have an application pattern that has high data ingest rates, so you're doing some sort of IoT type workload, or you are doing some sort of workload where the data ingest is spiky, and what you want to do is you want to ingest a lot of data quickly, you want to aggregate it and then write out a subset of that later on. Um, in memory, OLTP is excellent for that because um, it allows you to, to do that um, with, with very little problems. Um, if you have, the, the other application pattern is one of where you have very focused contention. So the classical example of this is web-based shopping carts um, or session uh, storage in a SQL server from an e-commerce site. So you have all of the shopping carts or all the users hitting one spot on the database. It gets very hot um, because of the way that the in-memory OLTP system works. It alleviates that, right? And you can all of a sudden get um, rid of that bottleneck. And then the third one is if you just have a hard requirement for very low latency, right? So we're talking latencies down in the sort of area of sub millisecond per transaction, right? And Microsoft is sort of quoting numbers around 20x performance improvements in some of these scenarios um, simply by just using this technology. Um, the beauty of it is too uh, for sort of developers or development organisations is that, that this technology is built inside the SQL Server core engine. There's no extra thing to install. There's no extra thing to learn. Um, the programming surface is a subset of the programming surface that they all know and in some cases love. Um, so it's very cheap to, to implement this solution. I talked also about column store indexes a little bit before. So, you know, one of the things that, that, that we're asking databases to do a lot of is to participate in analytic workloads. And um, one of the problems in analytic workloads is that, um, you know, generally you have to do entire table scans because you're doing aggregations of some sort, right? In this case, you might want to, to sum your total salary. And the problem with traditional row stores, as I've sort of tried to illustrate here a little bit, is if you want to just read the salary column, you've got to read all this other data as well in order to sum that column and scan through that entire table, right? When you have a column store, everything's all laid out on the disk in columns, right? Um, so this is good for two reasons. So the first reason is that for this example here, you'll notice that the values are actually not very selective. So that column would be compressed, right? Because the values are, uh, all those M's would be compressed. So you get a lot huge advantages out of compression. So even if you did have to scan that entire gender column, you could do it in much less IO because you don't have to read as much stuff off the disk because it's already compressed. Secondarily, if you do want to sum the salaries, you don't have to read all this data over on the left-hand side of the screen here. You just have to read that one column, right? So again, you're doing much less I.O., so you get better throughput, which will save you money. Speaking of saving money, um, buffer pool extension is another memory-related technology in SQL Server 2014. And it has uh, the benefit, I suppose, if you have um, of giving you a, a, or it has the, the advantage of giving you a benefit for a certain subclass again of, of, of issues. So if you have older hardware with full RAM slots so you can't fit any more RAM in the machines, um, you have dense virtualized um, 
sort of environments where you don't want to allocate more RAM to individual VMs. Then buffer pool may, extension may be for you. So what's buffer pool extension, you may ask? Well, so you have a query engine that's answering questions from users at the top, and in the middle you have some RAM, which is acting as a cache, which we call the buffer pool. And you have some slow disk. So every time you want to sort of service a query, um, the best thing to do would be to read it out of the RAM in the because it's fast instead of having to go to the disk to get it. The problem is if the data on the disk is bigger than the amount of memory you've got, then at some point you're going to have to go to the disk and get that data. So the more RAM, clearly, the better, right? But if you have one of these constraints, then here's how buffer pool extension can help. So this is the same picture um, that's been sort of turned sideways. So what buffer pool extension does is lets you specify some part of um, an SSD as an extension to memory, right? So the query engine will clearly try and get the, the data from memory if it can. If it can't, now it will get it from a, the cache on SSD. And if not, it will then still go to the disk. But because the SSD is two orders of magnitude faster than the, the spinning disk, um, though not quite as fast as RAM, um, that we get some pretty good gains out of that. And we did some testing uh, maybe 18 months, a year ago. Um, and I won't go into the details of this particular chart and how we did this testing, but the chart clearly shows on that top row, if you have um, the buffer pool, you'll get um, about two thirds better throughput right, on a memory constrained system. So when the data you have is bigger than the RAM you have, um, you'll get definite performance gains. Um, clearly more RAM is always better, but if you can't add RAM, then this is, this is another feature in 2014 that could be useful. Always on availability groups. So they were introduced in SQL Server 2008, and we finally then got a, a grown up way of doing high availability on SQL Server. Previously, we had um, a few iterations of, of, of technologies available to us. Um, a lot of people used failover clustering, uh, which is okay, but you've got, you have the problem then of, of having twice the hardware that's, that you need um, active at any one given time, ready for, for this um, event which may or may not ever occur. Um, so it was pretty costly, right? So for every SQL Server, you'd actually really have to have two. Um, and what Always On did was allow you um, to use the, the uh, to have a larger cluster to start with, and it allowed you to do it at database level, not instance level, so you could pick and choose how you did it. And it would also mean that the secondary nodes in that cluster were available for read purposes. So you'd actually be able to scale out your performance in certain app application patterns that in did mostly reads. So in SQL Server 2014, we've gone a little bit further than that. Um, secondary nodes have doubled. So again, now you've got twice potentially the, the throughput um, if you're running an app that takes advantage of this scale out read performance. Um, and the other benefit is that um, in SQL Server 2014, if the primary goes down, the secondaries are still readable, right? So um, it sort of enables you to increase the service level you had up until the point um, of 2014. Right, so if the, the cluster went down, the whole lot went down. Some additional, additional sort of flavoring on top of Always On, and th there's sort of a series of features in 2014 which are sort of aimed at hybrid cloud. Um, so Azure is, is, for Microsoft, for better or worse, Microsoft um, control both technologies. So they can do really good integration between SQL Server and Azure. And always on secondaries in 2014 can now be in an Azure VM. So as I've pictured here, you can have two secondaries on site and a third seeing an Azure VM. So why is this good? So again, if, you, if you're in a situation where you don't have today off-site disaster recovery or off-site like a secondary site high availability, um, this allows you to leverage any of the Azure data centers all over the world to do 
uh, to sort of bake your own off-site high availability at high reliability and relatively low cost because you don't have all the capital expenditure of having to go and set up another data centre somewhere. You can use Microsoft. Keeping along with the Azure theme, um, an Azure URL can now be a backup target. So you can write Azure backups or write SQL Server backups straight to Azure. So why you, may you want to do this? There's a number of reasons. Um, if you're in or intend to be in a hybrid cloud environment, being able to shift um, data quickly and easily between on-prem and off-prem or to be able to be always just doing the backups and then have them um, be able to be restored within a cloud environment. So you get um, the, the ability of, of fast and easy migration and it's all sort of built into the whole process. The other benefit is that storage is pretty cheap in Azure. Well, it's cheap in all the clouds. Um, so if you have plenty of network bandwidth between your data center and the, one of the Azure data centers, um, storage is pretty cheap. And then sort of furthering on that theme is then you get to take advantage of all the goodness of um, Azure blob storage. So you get geo-redundant storage and you get snapshot backups and all the sort of things that you normally get. Taking advantage of that technology. So again, more Azure integration features. So now we can also put data files in the cloud. So here's another um, uh, quite a useful thing. Again, if you're already looking at doing dev and test or dev and UAT in, in the cloud, um, which you should seriously look at if you're not, because again, it's quite good use of, of dollars. Um, you can do things like mount, unmount that data file like any other data file from this server and put it into a cloud server and vice versa. So you get to be able to mix and match um, and make your disaster recovery scenarios a little bit more um, sort of deep and, and um, useful. Um, there are some security uh, concerns here which Microsoft have addressed by making sure that the encryption keys are stored at the server. Um, so even if that data file was in Azure and your uh, Azure account was compromised, um, unless they had the encryption key from the on-prem server, they wouldn't be able to read the data in the data file. Um, and again, the same sort of things that you get with Azure Blob Storage. You get geo-redundancy, you get um, uh, the snapshot backup and all the sort of other goodness that you normally get. So that was a sort of a trip through all of the whys. You know, we talked about the time to migrate. There's a list of all the whys. There's 10 years of feature gap that you can take advantage of. Um, but how do you get there, right? If you are on 2005 today, how do you sort of move to the latest versions? I've sort of broken this down um, with some help from some people at Microsoft into sort of three steps. So the idea is that you would clearly work out where you are today. Um, second step would be to work out where you want to go and the third step would actually be make the move. So we can help and, and clearly Microsoft can help at all of those three different stages. Um, um, in terms of working out what's involved in an upgrade and what you might want to do as part of an upgrade, um, at its simplest, <coughs> I mean, you can clearly upgrade a SQL Server instance from one version to another in place without any hassle at all. Um, in this particular case, given that you're upgrading 10-year-old systems to modern ones, you're probably going to look at new or changed hardware investment. If they're not virtualized, you would probably want to look at virtualization. There's a lot of um, sort of items that would have to go into your, your decision tree around this. So there's some documentation on the Microsoft website that can help you do that. Um, certainly, when you're thinking about where you're going to go to, right? So um, do you want to be still all on-prem? Do you want to be in a hybridized environment? Are there some applications that you're running today that in, in, in reality would be probably a better fit with the, the database as a service technology that exists in Azure today? So th these are all things also for consideration as part of where you want to and how you want to get to where you want to go. Excuse me. And then in terms of upgrading, um, you know, both Dell and Microsoft can certainly help help you there. Once you've actually made the move, um, you know, the organization I work for, Dell Software, um, certainly has a lot of tooling to help you manage that estate if you're not already taking advantage of that. 
So let's talk a little bit more about how Dell can help with some of this stuff. So uh, we started breaking this down and thinking about expressing this term, expressing this in terms of a data journey. Uh, and I have four steps here, so reactive, informative, predictive and transformative. And in fact, Michael talked a little bit about this this morning in the keynote, if you were there, uh, in terms of digital transformation. And it's not really meant to be prescriptive, and, we'll, and I'll drill down to this in a little bit more detail, but the idea is that, that we want to move, I think, particularly as an industry, and like myself as a database person, from a situation where databases are merely systems of record, on the left hand side here to actually where databases can help um, drive the business and provide sort of potentially new streams of, of revenue. Uh, as Michael said, um, you know, technology is not a uh, part of the business case, it is the, the, the business. So let's break this down a little bit more in terms particularly of the, what we're talking about today with SQL Server migration. So if you think about reactive and system of record, um, you know, you may, we're talking about a 10 year old software here, right? We've got structured data from line of business apps. Um, you know, we've got three nines of availability potentially. Um, uh, we may have a data mart. Uh, you know, we, uh, I've used, heard the term spread mart where we just export the data from the database and put it in a spreadsheet and do graphs on that. Uh, we have basic batch and operational reporting. Um, you know, IoT could be either a, a, a distant want or could be very basic in terms of connected devices. And our deployment is largely on premise, right? And that's what the picture looked like 10 years ago. Fast forward a little bit into um, SQL Server 2008, particularly the, the releases where Microsoft started talking a lot about BI and getting value added data. Uh, you know, we're now we're in a sort of um, world where, you know, that data, still mostly structured though and still stored in relational databases, um, is analysed centrally. The data informs the business. We're actually doing some reporting off it now. Um, we've introduced the concept of virtualization, uh, and we have a sort of higher expectation around availability. We may have a data warehouse. We're, we're probably doing historical reporting and some ad hoc sort of analysis. And uh, in terms of maybe an IoT story, you might be doing some remote monitoring and some asset management, asset tracking. And we may be starting to think about um, dev and test in the cloud as well as on-prem production deployments. So moving further down this journey into predictive, um, you know, now we have, you know, data capture that's comprehensive. So we're storing a lot more data, right? It's sort of the idea is we should now, storage is cheap, we should store everything. Um, some of it may or may not be structured. Um, we expect high security because we sort of live in a, in a, in a world with lots of bad actors. Um, again, probably higher expectations of, of, of availability. Uh, and we're starting to use some new technologies to scale up, right? Because the data is not just relational and it could be unstructured, now we may be using Hadoop and some other open source type, type products or ecosystems to do some of our analytics. And certainly end users of analytics are expecting um, you know, self-service views and self-service dashboarding and, and, and a mobile solution. And certainly in the IoT world, we're looking at asset operations and improvements, and we're trying to use the data to improve our business. We're not just being informed by it. And we're sort of starting to really think seriously about the cloud now. Maybe it's um, backup and high availability, as well as dev test. Uh, and we may be starting to look at doing some of our new application development in the cloud. And that takes us to the end of transformative. So the idea here is that, that our, and maybe an end state is that, you know, we, the data transforms business, right? So we're not just reacting to the data. Data is, it's a big virtuous circle, right? And, you know, users are expecting real time. Um, we've got this concept of a data lake. We've got, as well as scale up, we've got scale out. Um, we're, we're expecting to do it in a cost-effective way. Um, certainly on the analytics side, we're looking at exploratory and predictive now, machine learning, 
um, stream processing, again, this sort of real-time idea. And on the IoT front, maybe we're doing predictive maintenance and new business, right? And again, our end state description might be it's fully hybrid cloud, right? We can choose how we mix and match our deployments, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. So sort of folding out this picture and trying to answer that question of, of where Dell can help. So clearly, if, if you're a SQL Server shop, um, you know, Dell, Dell can help you with sort of licensing for this whole sort of thing from top to bottom. Um, you know, you can run it on Dell hardware. Um, we also have server storage and networking, clearly, so infrastructure. Um, we can support all that with services, right? So there's a whole menu of stuff that you can choose from here in terms of migration. You know, we can help you actually do upgrades. We can, we've got a BI and an IoT practice and digital transformation practice. All of this stuff is available. And then when you look at sort of layering on top of this picture, sort of where Microsoft fit in, so clearly they have the database platform, right, that we're building all this on. Um, they also have a lot of capability around um, sort of what the end user can do in terms of their capability with Office 365, Power BI, um, even humble old Excel, right? Um, and then in the cloud, they've got HD Insight, which is their Hadoop implementation or Hadoop distribution, which is also available on-prem. There's the, the duality of um, of analytics parallel systems and the and the cloud data warehouse service. Um, they've just recently announced Data Lake. So there's all this sort of cloud-based functionality that you can take advantage of for Microsoft. Um, again, some more of this sort of stuff if you're doing machine learning, particularly if you're doing IoT style apps where there's a lot of complex event processing happening. Um, Microsoft can help out with, with again, more technology both on-prem and in the cloud. You know, where Dell can help, again, lay it on top of this, is I talked a little bit about services in the data warehouse practice. Um, you know, over here in the predictive and transformative sort of area, there's some business continuity and DR stuff. Again, some help around um, the, the, the parallel server. BI and analytics practice, again, with services. Um, certainly, and from the software perspective, we have analytics products, Statistica, um, if you are doing uh, data preparation type work, Toad Data Point is also an excellent sort of uh, product for that sort of use case. Dell Services again with the IoT practice, uh, looking across the spectrum in terms of uh, maturity, in terms of um, this journey. You know, in the later stages, um, Boomi and Statistica. If you've got applications um, and analytics that you need to uh, tie data together from various sources. Um, again, for, in terms of deployment across this whole journey as well, if you're running a SQL Server state on-prem, um, we ha certainly have a lot of tools to help that make, make that more productive and cheaper and easier. Um, performance management in Spotlight, Toad for SQL Server from the development and DBA type perspective. Lightspeed for disaster recovery. Uh, SQL Optimizer if you want to tune SQL. Um, and then services, again, you know, can help tie all this together for you. So I've been asked to actually let you know about an offer that um, where Dell can help with this um, for, for certain qualified customers. Uh, I think this, there could be some Dell people in the room that can help you with this um, after the talk, but certainly that email address. Uh, for qualified customers, we can help sort of um, invest in this sort of journey with you. Uh, along with Microsoft um, and sort of help make the, the whole thing a bit easier. Um, so certainly if you're interested in something like that, come and see me afterwards. And it would certainly be remiss of me to not mention um, SQL Server 2016. So I've talked all the way up to SQL Server 2014. Um, SQL Server 2016 is the one that's coming next, uh, potentially by the time that you might be embarked on the journey we were just talking about. Uh, if you have SQL Server 2005 servers, maybe the answer is depending on timing that you actually go straight to 2016. Um, and um, 
I'll just build all this out and then talk to it. So clearly, um, you know, it's an industry leader. Uh, it's, it's all grown up now. Um, Security-wise, it's um, the best in the industry right now in terms of database platforms. Um, data warehousing, end-to-end -end mobile, BI on any device, Power BI we use internally. It's excellent work. Um, and certainly the in-memory in, in functionality in 2016 is going to be much improved even over 2014. Um, so we've been working with 2016 internally, I know, in Dell IT for quite some time and are very impressed with it. Um, certainly my own organisation builds tools for SQL Server, so we've been working extensively with it and uh, are pretty pleased with what we see. So we are looking forward to the release of SQL Server 2016. And then s the last thing I suppose I want to call out before uh, I open up the floor for questions and then potentially give you uh, some of the hour back is um, if you have a look down at the Expo Hall, um, Microsoft are down there, so they'd be only ple too pleased to talk to you. Um, we have uh, the Lifecycle Services people down there, if you follow that where that red arrow goes. Um, over in the big data area, you'll find the SQL Server Tools people who would be only too happy to talk to you. Uh, so come and come and have a chat with us. But um, unless anybody's got any questions, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, could you talk a little about uh, endless migration uh, to current versions, uh, new opportunities for uh, redundancy? I, when you mentioned the clustering going up to 64 million, Yeah, so f there, there are so many high availability technologies um, in SQL Server that are still supported. Um, failover clustering in particular, that there are some scenarios in which um, there is no other option other than failover. But I wouldn't call it the go-to solution in the light of the, avail the always on availability clustering now. Yes. Bail down and hand on everything on the keyboard and uh, interrupt your application and you need to uh, do some serving to come back. Yep. Uh, so uh, I, I think that that might be particularly satisfying for users. Yeah, al always on is better at that. There is, there is um, a much shorter time at, at which if the node that you're connected to goes down, um, because the, there are generally more nodes, and it's, it's designed not to be, we're going to fail over services from one computer to another computer. It's, it's I'm going to service a query and I'm going to go and get the data from one of these eight available nodes. So the chances of all eight of them being down at once are like pretty close to zero, unless you've got an entire data center failure. In which case, again, you can split always on available, always on across multiple data centers. So that, that pattern where the, where the application sits and waits because there's a persistent error whilst the cluster fails over is, is not as pronounced for always on. Yeah. I didn't touch on a lot of the stuff. There's licensing things too. Depends on, on what your relationship with Microsoft is like and whether you have software assurance or not. And sometimes licensing drives the decisions on this somewhat. Um, but the, the best person, I'm not the best person to talk to on that, Microsoft would be. Yeah, so encryption in SQL Server 2016 is now pretty pervasive. Um, you can do encryption at column level. Uh, you can do it, you can have the database encrypted. It's all at multi levels, um, and the key management is much more mature than what it was in the past. Um, 
it's been a little while since I've looked at all the details of that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, encryption as an option certainly didn't exist in sort of up until 2014 and certainly much improved in 2016. There are two. There's uh, Spotlight and SQL Server, and yep, and SQL Optimizer for SQL Server. Yep. So, um, so I'd say two things. So first of all, the, the hints that you can give the Oracle Optimizer are a lot more granular um, than what you can give the SQL Server Optimizer. In fact, I'd argue that you, when you give hints in a query to SQL Server, you're not really hinting the Optimizer. Um, what you're doing is telling the, the um, storage engine to change the way it does its lock behavior. Um, which is a little bit different sometimes. Um, so it's sort of hard. They're both cost-based optimizers. Um, and you're right, SQL Server, if you tell it to do no lock and it can't do no lock, it won't do no lock. Whereas in Oracle, usually it will do what you tell it to do. Um, yeah, I mean, both, both the SQL optimizer products do do effectively what the optimizer does, but because of they have infinite amount of time to do it in, because what you do is you say, here's a SQL statement, optimize this, and it'll go through and rewrite it umpty times, and then it will start testing those rewrites against the engine and to work out which one's best. Big fan of Spotlight. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. I know it's tough first session back after lunch. <laughs>